order? Are we streaming? Just went live. Beautiful. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us tonight, gang. Um, I am President Diane Hall, and I'd like to kick things off with a couple of um, sad announcements. Um, I learned on uh, about a week ago um, that John Root, long-term member of the club, uh, going back many years, has passed away. Mm -hmm. um, found this out okay. from his brother, Greg. Um, it appears that John has left the Warren Astronomical Society a bequest in his will. Really? So I will be wow. meeting with Greg to uh, find out what's going on with that. And also, um, he has a substantial archive that I'll be taking a look at to see if there's anything of interest to the history group, anything to fill in the gaps on either the history of the Warren Astronomical Society or some of our um, you know, key members from back in the day, or perhaps things from other clubs like the Detroit Astronomical Society. So um, very sad news, very kind of him to remember us in his will. And um, since John, of course, uh, his involvement and the club predates me by quite some time. If any of you have memories of John, especially from uh, when he was an officer, if you could send them to either me or to publications and we can get those into the WASP uh, for a proper memorial. For those of you who missed um, the banquet, we also learned the day of the banquet of the passing of a long-term member and uh, frequent astronomy at the beach volunteer Gary Flat. So um, we did not have time to get a proper obituary together for the tribute that night. So again, if you've got any additional memories of Gary and some of you like Dale Teamy way back with him, um, please send them in uh, so that we can acknowledge our our lost members. It's uh, it's been a very sad twelve months. Sure. Uh, on a happier note. Um, uh, for those of you who missed the Cranbrook meeting, uh, we've been talking to Cranbrook, uh, both behind the scenes with Mike Narlock, our patron, and with the wonderful staff who let us in the door on Monday nights. And just making sure that everybody knows everybody's alive, the club exists, we want to come back when it's safe. Right now it's not safe. And Cranbrook is pretty okay with that. Um, so, <laughs> so that's that. Um, uh, is the Cranbrook okay. Science Museum open to the public? The Cranbrook Science Museum is. It is very different from what you might imagine, John. I had the opportunity to go there with Jonathan and our nieces uh, right before the new year. So the gift shop that was downstairs uh, and frequently seen during our board meetings is now a little kiosk upstairs. There's a hands-on section that's very spaced out down in the basement now. Um, the water lady has been turned off. So for those of you who remember board meetings being disrupted by the water lady, a robot. Uh, she's quiet. <laughs> Bob knows the pain of tripping off the water lady. Don't walk um, by that. Oh, shoot. Yeah. So she was quiet. Um, and they have a fabulous limited time exhibit all about space that I highly recommend all of you check out. Bring the grandkids, bring the great grandkids. Um, it's full spectrum human spaceflight exploration from a wonderful laminated copy of life magazine featuring profiles of the apollo 11 gang for weirdos like me who want to stand there reading a magazine at a museum to fantastic hands-on feet on climb around uh exhibits for youngsters who want to be the next generation of astronauts so our uh patron museum is going gangbusters with this limited time space exploration exhibit down in the basement past what used to be the gift shop highly recommend all of y'all check that out okay um and with that i will pass things to our newly minted first vice president mr robert trembley oh yikes okay well um i've got a good schedule uh, up until uh march i'm i need a short presentation for uh march 7th then we're good up until May. Um, I uh, posted something in chat here that got Ken all excited. I've been playing around with an app called the Worldwide Telescope. It's pretty darn cool. Um, I just posted uh, on 
uh, their Twitter account. I, I'd like somebody who knows more about it than I do to give a presentation. So I am working on getting us some other presentations. But if anybody in the club would like to give a presentation, uh, just contact me and I will slot you in for later this year. That's pretty much it. Fabulous, Bob. And over to Riyadh's second VP, Dean of Start. Thank, thank you, Diane. Um, yeah, last uh, open house we had was uh, on the 18th, December 18th. Um, uh, we had uh, basically one uh, new member, possible new member visiting. Uh, so I uh, had the observatory open from about 6 to 7.30. Uh, I plan on uh, opening the observatory this coming Saturday. Again, we have an, um, the next open house uh, on the 22nd. Uh, so I should be there about uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, unless the weather is really bad, um, then um, it would be canceled. But um, there may be a chance of uh, some uh, few breaks in the clouds. I'm not sure what we will be able to, whether we'll be able to see anything or not. But I'll try to be there about uh, 6 o'clock and maybe stay there for about an hour or so, uh, hour and a half, and see if uh, anybody else is interested in showing up. Um, if you're coming out, please uh, follow the same rules that we've been following lately because of COVID. Um, uh, I highly recommend uh, you wear a mask, and if you're going to be inside the observatory, we definitely need a mask. We're only going to let uh, one person at a time inside the observatory unless it's a family. Um, and if it does clear up a little bit, uh, may be able to get the um, one of the small telescopes out, uh, possibly the uh, 10 inch uh, Orion, um, get it outside and maybe we can uh, take a look through it. Uh, we still have uh, those little foam uh, eyepiece cups that uh, um, we have uh, to use for uh, additional safety. So hopefully we'll uh, they'll clear up and maybe we'll uh, see everybody out there. Um, that's all I have there, thank you. Thank you, Riyadh. Over to Secretary Mark Kedzier. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I really have nothing to report, so we're going to move on to our treasurer. Thank you. Very kind of you, Mark. Minutes are in the WASP. Uh, treasurer Adrian Bradley, our roving photographer. So, um, Mark wanted to transfer it to me because he's been helping me. He and Dale Timmy have been helping me out tremendously with um, gathering all of your memberships. Um, so our membership count, I would estimate at around 75 now, uh, renewed or paid memberships. Um, in the bank, we are still sitting at roughly $21,657, and there will be more to add. I am adding a report that's going to be in the WASP at the beginning of next month that will have a little more breakdown of our finances, where they're coming from, where they're going, as well as new memberships, as well as um, those whom I've got that have um, updated their membership. So if you updated your membership and you're not sure if, if anything's been processed, you can always send me an email, let me know. Also, on the topic of magazine subscriptions, I've been finding out from a fellow treasurer in one of uh, my other clubs and found that you can go to the Astronomy Magazine uh, website and you go to a specific website for club members and you get the discounted subscription for Astronomy Magazine. I think it's... it's um, even more discounted than if you just go to their regular site. I'm going to give Sky and Telescope a call because on their site it says no physical magazine subscriptions, but I was informed prior to the meeting. Um, a little birdie told me they just got their Sky and Telescope in the mail, and this little birdie said there must be uh, physical subscriptions. So I got to do some homework for you all to, uh, you know, make sure that physical subscriptions are still available. So I will work on that. In addition to all of the other projects that I have going, your treasurer wants to write a book on one of the places that he's been, Point O'Bark Lighthouse, and share some of the images there, uh, as well as continuing doing work with David at Global Star Party, 
Uh, we were postponed this week, but next week we should be back with our 81st Global Star Party in, in which David will start it off with a poem. And somewhere in the night, I'll be on doing uh, pictures, uh, images of the night sky that I've taken, which lately have been with a uh, with an iPhone. Um, so Im uh, interesting pics that I've tried to do using my iPhone. Astronomical League um, will renew, and I found out directly from the Astronomical League themselves that um, all memberships will start anew in J on July 1st. So the, uh, if you are an Astronomical League member and you, ex you will expire on uh, the last day in June of this year, and if you send in your dues to be renewed, I will be sending in a check on your behalf that will include your dues for the Astronomical League so that your membership will not lapse throughout 2022 and it will be good from July 2022 until June 2023. The, the Astronomical League year basically goes overlaps uh, calendar years. So I think that's it. I will go ahead and turn the meeting back over to our esteemed president and um, listen, be listening in. Any que I saw something in the chat, and of course, any questions can go to treasurer at warrenastro.org or send them to me in the chat. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Adrian. And I uh, believe our new outreach chair, Kevin McLaughlin, is not available tonight. Uh, minutes from the previous outreach report are in the WASP, and please send your outreach-related stuff, um, you know, to outreach at warrenaster.com, and we'll make sure it gets to Kevin. Okay. I'm going to be on the Warren uh, on the uh, on the uh, Wyand uh, television on on uh, on uh, next oh, Wednesday. Good. Astronomy doing, for everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be doing uh, the the one that I did last time, the, the life and death of a star. Nice. I've already contacted them. We're all set to go. All right, and be sure to let our outreach guy know all of your good activities so that they can appear properly in the report, which Thank is you. published in our award-winning publication. Take it away, Dale. I was distracted by the email. Um, okay, the January WASP was online, and work on the February WASP continues rather well. We still have five calendars left, so if anybody's looking to get a WASP cal WAS calendar for uh, 2022, we've got five available, so let us know if you want one. $15 a copy, $5 shipping and handling. And uh, only had three or four mailers come back so far as undeliverable. We were able to fix two of the addresses, so a lot of progress has been made there. Back to you, Diane. Very good, Dale. Okay. Um, subgroup report. We've got Bob is post posting solar links right now. There wasn't a whole lot of activity on the sun going on earlier this week. A uh, double star group meets when Riyadh opens the Stargate Observatory. So that would be the fourth Saturday of the month, unless inclement weather gets in the way. History subgroup chairperson right there, Dale Teamy. You got anything for us tonight, Dale? Uh, afraid not. All right. Well, we'll see if I can fix that, um, depending on what I find <laughs> okay. at people's houses. All um, right. We've got the astrophotography group. I thought I saw Bell Bears. Was that a an illusion? Anyway, uh, I see Doug. Doug, what have you got for us? Oh, you're going to actually make me move here. <laughs> uh, we've had, uh, I, I'm out here at Northern Cross Observatory. I've had um, uh, four clear nights this month, uh, the second and third. In fact, that's the reason I missed the Cranbrook meeting. I forgot all about it because I was open up and actually uh, imaging all night, uh, both the second and the third. Um, and uh, I had another night here where I did a double cluster, which will be in the next uh, next month's uh, issue of the WASP. Um, that's uh, if you guys have any questions about astrophotography or <clears throat> um, 
you know, wide field or through scope, uh, I'd be happy to take questions at uh, either via email or we can set up a separate uh, WebEx meeting. We can talk about astrophotography stuff. Okay. Very good. And of course, uh, get cracking on making this year's batch of fabulous pictures so we can have a splendid calendar come 2023. Okay. Uh, other subject um, groups, we have a newly reborn radio astronomy group. Uh, Tom from the McMath Holbert Astronomical Society has switched to the WAS for a very sad reason, which is that the McMath Holbert guys no longer have access to their observatory site. So Tom uh, approached me and I said, we would love to have the radio subgroup up and running. So that's um, Tom Hagen is the newly appointed chairperson of the radio astronomy subgroup. We are going to see if we can reactivate the old um, email so that he can be contacted. He's got some great plans. They did have a functioning radio set up at McMath Holbert. So um, this is this is good. This is some of the one of the coolest things that we've been able to resurrect in a while. So um, is he round doing of any daytime meteor stuff with radio? You know, um, let's find out. I don't know for sure. I, I, I got a lot of um, information on the specs of this stuff, but I don't know the specifics about what they're observing. I know they were doing the Sun and Jupiter, which, you know, the pretty easy stuff. But, um, yeah, so that's great. So we'll have a radio subgroup and subgroup reports to look forward to going forward. Um, Adrian already covered Astronomical League. The library is still locked up in some of it's in our storage unit, some of it's in... A Stargate and some of it is currently being housed by um, members uh, for safekeeping until we find a permanent place to to put it. Um, we also have archive wise, Jonathan and I have been hanging on to a lot of archival wasp stuff that at this point, um, the IRS was not going to be interested in any of it. It's well past seven years old. If you would like archival wasp stuff to keep, and your name is not Dale Teamy because he's got enough, um, let me know uh, because I would like it out of my house at this point. Otherwise, um, the financial records and such, uh, record keeping practices suggest that things like that be purged. Again, these are well over seven years old, IRS not interested. So, um, we may be having a record purge party this year because we just don't have room for this stuff after, you know, 14 years. Anyway, if interested, contact me, presidentwarnaster.org. Um, and with that, uh, the boring stuff, I would like to turn things over to observing reports in case anybody had any more clear days than Doug or any sightings of Comet Leonard or whatnot. So raise your hand and let's be heard. Uh, Riyadh's hand got up first. Riyadh. Yeah, thank you, Diane. Um, actually, I've been uh, looking uh, at a uh, few sunspots, and the sun has been uh, relatively active uh, the last few days. Um, showed it to the kids, too, basically doing uh, solar projection, so it's pretty safe. Um, and it's um, keep an eye on that. Uh, we're getting a lot of good uh, sunspots sometimes, uh, big enough that you may not even need a telescope to see them. Uh, be sure to wear the, or to use the proper um, uh, filters uh, when you're observing the sun. Thank you, Dan. All right. Thank you, Riyadh. Who else? Who else? I see Doug Box hand up. Go for it, Doug. Ooh, pretty. So on those few clear nights, I did uh, the following. <clears throat> this is uh, Comet uh, L3 Atlas, C, uh, 2019 L3 Atlas. It was on January 2nd. This was uh, IC342 on January 2nd. Nice. This was M81 and M82 on January 3rd. 
plate solved as well. Uh, this was the um, Heart Nebula on January 3rd, uh, otherwise known as MEL-15 and IC 1805. These are all with my four inch refractor. And let's see what else. And there's the double cluster. Beautiful. And uh, lots of little galaxies off in the, near the double cluster as well. And that's my observing report. Aha, wonderful. All right. Does our member down in Arizona have anything to report, sir? I expect you have better weather than we do. Yeah, I'm going to save mine until the uh, main, main presentation coming up soon. Tonight. Understood, okay. sir. Anything else, gang? I know it's been a lousy January. Jonathan and I went up to our dark sky site this weekend and did see a halo around the full moon, which was quite nice. Um, would have made a lovely okay. picture had, had we equipment for that. Well, I have my hand raised. Um, Do you now? Very good. Yeah, so actual real observation. I don't recall if I mentioned using a new mount to track and look at the sun using a uh, solar scope in a uh, Coronado. It, once I got everything in focus, it was a beautiful sight. Let's see if I can, I'll share one image, uh, two images, um, or even three. Practicing with an iPhone, um, this is Orion showing through a uh, it's a small park off of uh, M5. I experimented with using the iPhone to do nightscapes and see what kind of stars I could get. And even in the full moon, I was able to pick up a few stars. You can kind of make out Orion there. So that's the uh, see if I can get that. And then not using. Um, Let's see, not using ready for your meals on wheels. Yeah, not using a uh, iPhone. This is a reprocess of a magical night in March when I was able to capture the Aurora at nice. Point O'Bark Lighthouse. Cool. And, uh, yeah, it was a it was a beautiful night to see it. Of course, I had to be up at three in the morning, and I stayed there till about eight. Taking images. Um, the uh, we'll go one last one and then we'll move on. That night, from where I was standing, if you turn around essentially and you fire out to the uh, southwest, you got the Milky Way rising. So this is going to occur. We get to see the core of the Milky Way again, starting late March. Um, this was the uh, equinox, so it was around March uh, 21st last year. So around the equinox is when all of this uh, yeah. imaging will be possible, and uh, Milky Way imagers will probably be taking to the cameras again. Um, there's still plenty to image in the night sky, but it is cold, so you have to uh, bundle up when you go out to those places. So that is it for my observing report. It's been few and far between, and it's been cold, but it's been worth it. Your, your pictures are Mozart, absolutely Mozart. I appreciate that. and. Uh, You've just seen a preview of some of the images I'll be sharing uh, next week, David. I've actually got some from when it was six degrees uh, Fahrenheit and I was there. And uh, I posted to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and they said six degrees, that's balmy. Meaning <laughs> six, 11, 11, what was it? Six degrees Fahrenheit was... Uh, quite balm is quite balmy for those in Canada. And you know, after doing that 
as the temperatures rose to 27 and 30 and I was outside, it really did feel balmy. I was thinking I must be getting used to cold weather again. So, so those things happen. Uh, stay warm and stay safe. Thank you, Adrian. Any other observing reports before we go to uh, bio break? I would just like to make a, a comment. Uh, if you saw the recent post about the asteroid that was going to pass by the Earth, CBS <laughs> News posted something on Twitter, all right? And they showed an animation. Here's the Earth with this asteroid coming in, okay? I brought up this eyes on the ast uh, NASA's <laughs> eyes on asteroids, which I, I linked in the chat here, all right? Okay, uh, the closest approach to that asteroid, Earth, was a, you could see it over there and there's the orbit of the moon so yeah not worried about that one <laughs> what are we gonna do <laughs> watch it fly by safely <laughs> they could use the word safely and that would be good oh that's great that, that's my that's my rant <laughs> so uh we've got a question from the youtube channel um that what is the news about Oumuamua? Um news about Oumuamua is there's a proposed mission to catch up to it by 2054. How are they gonna catch up with Oumuamua? I thought it was going out already. It it is, Ken. This is this is the whole all right. So let's just separate that from the whole it's an alien craft because it's not. So, researchers from the UK based nonprofit initiative for interstellar studies, which sounds kind of sketch, frankly, is proposing to whip a spacecraft around the Earth twice, then to Venus and then to Jupiter to do the gravity momentum thing to get caught up with Oumuamua 26 years later in interstellar, interstellar space. This is called Project Lyra. And, uh, you know, they want to find out what it's made out of. So um, the author, Adam Hibbard, developed software for the project, says we know in principle this is achievable. The positive, possible scientific return would be tremendous, which, yes, it would. Um, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. So plausible theories for what Oumuamua is uh, include dust aggregate, hydrogen iceberg, nitrogen iceberg, and fragments of a tidally disrupted planet. Um, so these are the sorts of things that they would like to figure out. So we'll uh, pop this in the chat. And yes, that is the news in Oumuamua. A group that is not NASA or the ESA or JAXA is proposing a mission, which that's cool. But, you know, um, again, super heavy lift there. And please don't mention aliens. All right. Um. I'm so ready for that. <laughs> 26 years is a long time, kid. I'm not ready for that. I have, a, I have a comment. Yes. I think there would be a major difficulty with how you would power such a spacecraft because Good. by the time it caught up with that chunk of rock or whatever it is, it'd be way out there where you can't use solar cells. Right. So it's already way, out past. It's already out to Neptune. Yeah. So the only I mean, way I, you could power such a spacecraft would be with a radioisotope generator, which, if you're not doing this with NASA or or Russia, maybe the Chinese, you're not doing it. I think they should send one of the people that is proposing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> let's let's see where this goes. That's all. I I yeah. I agree with you, Good. Dale. Getting your hands on uh, radioisotopes when you're not a governmental space agency. God, what? What are you doing? Go right in the dumpsters at the hospital? You know? Yeah. Even even NASA is almost out of that stuff. Right. They're starting a very expensive government program to start making plutonium 238 again. Yep. But it'll take a while. 
Very good. Stone. Okay, it's eight o'clock. Let's have a 15 minute uh, bio break. Tonight is a panel discussion. I, if you have not seen the details on our mailers about what, who and what is, you know, going to be speaking, I'm not going to spoil it for you, but in order to give our panelists room to breathe, uh, we're doing a slightly altered run of show tonight. So 15 minute bio break. We'll see y'all at 815. Dynamite. I'm getting some deep. Now they're taking the break. I'm showing here uh, NASA's Eyes on Asteroids website. And in the center of the screen, there is Earth. And here are the five asteroids passing by the Earth, the closest. And what you're seeing here, that's the orbit of the moon. So look how far away those guys are. Hey, Bob, I was looking through my Facebook feed. I couldn't find it, but someone, an amateur, had taken a picture of this most recent giant asteroid. Ah, um, it was a, and, it was a dot, wasn't it's it? It's a dot. It it, it, yep. it was basically a, a a gif gif animation. Yep. Of of several frames of it moving, you know, through a section of space, and it was other than its movement, indistinguishable from a star. So yeah, I. Uh... So, you know, all these, oh, it drives me nuts when I see all these hype, you know, asteroid going to fly by the Earth. You know, I, I'll, I will, all of these asteroid flybys are measured in lunar distances. <laughs> and uh, when you start getting to like 0.1, those are the ones that are interesting because, you know, they're coming in past the geosynchronous satellite ring and changing their orbits because of the Earth's gravity. Now, those are the ones that I'm going to worry about. But the ones that are way out past the moon, uh -huh, it happens every day. Yeah, but the ones that are really close are the ones that we, we normally miss anyways. Bob, it looks yeah, like they move so fast, they're hard to aim at. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a note to Bob. I'm going to have to uh, do my little thing now. But if you could put me on towards the end of the panel, I should be back within an hour. Okay. Is that okay, Bob? Sure, sure. Okay, Just thanks a million. We'll see you guys in, later. Hop in and wave. We'll see you. Thanks. David's got a star party to go to, so uh, double booked. David is triple booked. Triple booked? Every night, yeah. And he's busy, but... Loves it, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I gotta I gotta share something on Twitter that I posted. I uh got my granddaughter a pair of binoculars. She's uh, she's uh almost two years old. And uh she figured these suckers out in under twenty seconds. I was shocked. But, but she was doing it inside the house, so it uh, she was she was holding them backwards. But still, there we go. Let's share that screen. So there she is. Literally, I gave those to her, and she and she figured them out in twenty seconds. Now she's looking through it the long, the long way, or the wrong way. <laughs> but when she got the microscope on, <laughs> she was not quite. Every, everything was really far away. But she's walking around the house with it like that. But I, I did find a uh, a children's spyglass. I think I'm going to get her one of those. But uh, those those are shock resistant child uh, binoculars and that was good because i i wonder if they're saliva resistant because that's an issue but yeah she dropped them already so i'm glad they're shock resistant i just posted a link or talking about the asteroid uh there was a website from italy that was live streaming it so 
that's kind of cool. You can see the yeah. their images of it. Yeah, if you're if you're expecting to see like an asteroid, no, you're not gonna see that. that Sorry, y'all. I was not on mute. That drives me nuts when the media does that. Well, it's par for the course lately. We things in space in order to be fantastic. I think the media has decided people won't read it unless there's some element of uh, theatrics. So it doesn't matter that the asteroid's nowhere near close enough to do any real damage. If it's a considered a close quote unquote asteroid, we're going to we're going to get the uh, slant that this thing close enough to hit us. Sensationalism. Yes, people will, then the people will come. All about how many people will read it. And the the more sensational, the possibility that it could kill us all, that makes people read it these days. Yikes. Hey, guys, I had mentioned uh, that I was looking for a scope. I picked up a Celestron AVX 8-inch that uh, woman was selling her husband passed away. So I think I got a pretty good deal on it. it had a boatload of accessories and uh, USB extension cables and network to USB adapters and uh, the two inch Celestron you know, lens kit with filters and just a gaggle of stuff that I picked up with this thing and then picked up a uh, one of the auto align modules for it. So, I'm up and running. I've used it a couple of times, just just playing around, trying to get used to the AVX and remote access with it, and uh, actually heading down to Florida tomorrow. So I hope to have some clear skies down there, going down for a couple of weeks. You don't have the Michigan perma perma cloud down there. <laughs> yeah, that's Man, a good okay. plan. Is it an HD or uh, the uh, evol- what what's it's actually that's the uh the Celestron 8 inch AVX advanced VX. That's the mount. The... That's I guess the brand the the scope they have it as a bundle as well. So yeah, but they, they sell it in different varieties. They sell one that, that's called Edge HD, it'll say it on the side, or yeah. no, nope. what's the other one? XLT optics or something. Uh, it does have them with their ultra bright coating and what what color is the scope? black okay then it's not an edge hd no no um uh because those are lightish closer to white but it's yep. off no, black scope yeah. um he must have been doing astrophotography because he had a small shed uh like a small barn next to his house that he had two different access ports cut into his ceiling in his roof with elevations to put a scope up through it. And yeah, his wife said he did a lot of photography with it. And That would be uh, a good scope for doing planetary photography. I, uh, I started with planetary on a, uh, I ended up getting a C11 um, and a nice. large amount, but um, same basic thing. Well, I've got some good planetary. I mean, again, just with, you know, Saturn and Jupiter with that five inch that I had or the 130. But I'm looking forward with this one. I got some uh, some images of Jupiter um, a couple nights ago until the clouds rolled in. So don't have, you know, too much time on it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. It's like, man, what a difference. So, so the difference the between the Edge HD and the regular has to do with corrective optics. <laughs> so if you do buy any focal reducers. Yeah, I've got the one that was at 6.2. or 0.62, yeah. Yeah, something like that. So again, he had that with it. Um, I've got a you know, the 2X Barlow in the two inch, and then I had a 2X Barlow with my one and a quarter inch lens set that I've got. Uh, I've got two inch diagonals. I've got the two inch to one and a quarter diagonal. Uh, yeah, like I said, the focal reducer off the back. So my understanding is with the focal reducer coming off the back, I would not want to use that if I'm using the two inch 
eyepieces, two inch diagonal and eyepiece. But if I'm using the one and a quarter inch eyepiece, I would want to use the focal reducer. Is that accurate? Um, <sighs> I think that focal reducer helps a little more for imaging, but uh, I have used it visually. If you want a wider field. It, it gives you a wider yeah. field with more light gathering capability. Okay. Um, I don't, you can use a quarter inch or a two inch eyepiece with the focal reducer either way. Um, I, I do have an HHD, which does have a wider corrected field of view. Hmm. Um, but quite frankly, I rarely use it. Um, optically, it's almost always set up with a camera. And yeah. normally when I look through it, I have like Barlow's cause I'm looking at planets. So yeah. I have two X, two and a half X anyway. And I, I, I don't have the focal reducer on it. Okay. What I was going to say is that that's one of the differences between the edge HD and the regular, just make sure you get the right focal reducer, but it sounds like you already have that. So you, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah. Like I said, that was on it. That focal reducer won't work with the edge HD because okay. so the, the lens is inside. Yeah, the only thing I bought extra, I bought the electric, uh, the focus motor, and the okay align camera, and I figure with, you know, my eyesight is is not what it used to be, and seeing Star stars Sense here auto in the gray area, huh, what's that? Star Sense Auto Align. Yeah. 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 And it picks up. I mean, here in Warren, it was still finding you know 100 stars in in some of the views, and it's like okay, I can see a few of them. So trying to align it though, the first day I got it that I had a clear sky. Okay, I got it aligned and but it took me a while to find the stars and, and get it set up. And I had one of those star sense aligns. I, I sold it off because I ended up not using it that much. Cause once I had it, I I used to cart it around, but it was too heavy for me. So I just have it like permanently mounted in my backyard under a uh, your scope. Yeah, what, what do you call okay. it? One of those, they're called telegizmos. It's basically a, a heavy duty tarp. All right. I uh -huh. saw one guy selling a, uh, like a portable little observatory that you could store your scope in and just slide the top off. And that looked pretty slick. I'd like to have an observatory, but. But yeah, I, I can't I wait to have less trees. <laughs> <laughs> and being able to set it out, I set it out in my my driveway uh, a couple nights ago. We had a few little bit of clear skies and had the cables running into the house. So I had my laptop in the house and being able to focus and slew it to uh, to various you know objects to check them out. It's like yeah. I didn't do any imaging, but playing around with the autofocus, it's like okay, this is the index number for you know the straight up camera. This is the one that I need if I'm using the the two X Barlow in it. It's like, okay, just go to that index number and you're focused. It's like, does it really work that there. well? The index number? It seems to. Wow. Like I, said, I went back and forth a couple times and it was, you know, pretty darn spot on. And then I put the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Mask on there to, to focus it on a star and kind of fine tuned it. And then I was looking at something else, changed the focus and then put that index number back on and it came right back into focus. It's like, okay. that's going to be nice. So I'm going to keep a little notepad of different lenses or combinations with their index number. So when I'm out in the field, I can just put that number in and, and I'm rolling. So I, I, I'm happy that you're getting pretty consistent results with the index number, but don't be surprised if you need to play with it. There's, there's okay, a lot everyone. of mirror, there can be a lot of mirror slop. It's uh, yeah. coming up on 815. We're going to start our presentation. And thanks, guys. Get it, get back in your seats and uh, let's uh, get the show on the road. Give it a couple seconds here. We have a question from Catherine about YouTube uh, sound cutting out. Anybody having that issue? I think she was referring to the presentation. I think that sound okay. cut out a few times in the uh, that YouTube video. All right, well, I'm gonna get this started now. Okay, this presentation, um, what we're doing tonight is uh, we're going to be talking, ha having several members 
uh, discuss what got them into astronomy. I originally was intending on doing this as uh, I was going to interview a whole bunch of people and create a video. And uh, yeah, that turned out to be a lot more work than I wanted to do. And I realized that everybody was going to be at this meeting anyway. So let's just do it in one meeting. So we've got several board members and uh, and I'm going to open it up to uh, uh, the membership after uh, we get started here. but. I'll start off here. What got me into astronomy? Well, I was born in 1960. Uh, well, <laughs> right, and I was a young man during the Apollo era. So I got a telescope at age eight. I can't even remember why, how, how all that happened, but I remember uh, t showing the uh, showing the neighbors Jupiter and Saturn through the telescope, telling them that it was a once in a lifetime experience. Well, okay, not so much, maybe for <laughs> them, but not for me anymore. But uh, so that's what got it started, and um, my telescope was from Sears Roebuck, and it had a foam rubber focusing wheel, and it dry rotted. So one day when I was trying to focus, it just wasn't working, and my my telescope stopped working. So yeah, that 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 was great, but I uh, I was doing outreach at eight years old. I was I was showing everybody who would look through my telescope, and. Uh, Pretty much, pretty much continued up until college when I didn't have a telescope, and and uh, uh, my wife got me a telescope, uh, with my eight-inch Dob, uh, when I on my 40th birthday, and it is now 20 years old and showing its age, so I got to get a new one. But so that that's what got me into astronomy. The the Apollo uh, era was in full swing. Uh, <laughs> 2001 A Space Odyssey came out when I was eight years old, Star Trek, all that stuff. So that, that's what got me into astronomy. So um, I'll, I'll uh, let's see, Diane is not here yet. So I'll let Ken, Ken, go ahead. I'll let you go next. Okay. Actually, I had four things that got me into astronomy. Uh, the first thing that happened, I was um, about six years old. And my, uh, and I have to understand that 70 years ago. I, uh, my sister came home from grade school and she had a science book, which had a picture of the planets on the front of it. And I'm looking at this book and I'm going, what's that all about? And she tried to explain a little bit. My dad did a little bit more explaining and explaining to me, those are the planets and um, this is the earth and so on and so forth. He didn't know much about astronomy anyway, but that's what he looked at. And I said to him, Thanks, Dad. And then the first book I was reading was an astronomy book is the first thing. And then when I was seven years old, he got me a Tasco uh, 60 millimeter and I threw it outside. I used to go out. I had a porch and it used to face uh, face the east. And um, I used to go out in the middle of the night when I was six and seven years old and watched uh, and started learning about where everything was. And um, uh it, it was it was a very, very exciting time for me. My I know my parents knew I was going out there at that age and everything like that, but they never said a word. And uh, I went out there, used to do it all the time. The second event was when I was 11 years old. At 11 years old, I went to, and some of you have heard this story before, I went to my, um, my uh, cousin's bar mitzvah. He was a couple of years older than I was. And I went to the bar mitzvah in Philadelphia and who was at the at the at bar mitzvah? But Max Fleischer, the cartoonist who created Betty Boop and Popeye the Sailor Man, and it was the first to do the Superman, uh, the Superman movies and everything like that. Very very well known. He was a direct competitor of Walt Disney, but his hobby was astronomy. And he said to me, "What what do you do?" And I said, "Well, my hobby is astronomy." And he says, "Really?" And he starts to talk to me about astronomy. He asked me, "Why is it that the?" Uh, that uh, it's cold in space and why does it get warm on the earth? And then he said, why is it? The other question he asked me was, why is it colder at the top of a mountain being closer to the sun than it was at the bottom of the mountain? And he explained to me about the source of heat is actually the earth and the radiation and all that other stuff. And I really, really was interested. And as a matter of fact, I have a presentation about him as well. The third event that occurred was at my bar mitzvah. Uh, when I was 13 years old, my father's um, uh, business associate, very wealthy guy, bought me an eight inch Dynamax with the motor drive. 
and it got to the house on the day of a, of a lunar eclipse. And I went outside with that thing at night. We plugged it in. They had a long cord, an extension cord that went into the house in the backyard. And I watched the lunar eclipse with my with my motor driven eight inch. And the last event that really got me involved was when I got into high school in Mumford High School in Detroit. I was a ninth grader and I organized an astronomy club. And we had an astronomy club and I was meeting before the, the kid, them all the time. It was pretty almost an, a, a teaching thing for me to give to them. And we had a physics teacher that was involved in it and uh, had a whole bunch of friends that became members of my astronomy club. And we had a picture every year in the yearbook of every one of us wore a suit. It was, it was something else. It was, uh, it was quite a thing. And those are actually the four events that really put me over. Now, when I went to summer camp, I took the eight, the, I didn't take the eight inch, I took the 60 millimeter with me because the eight inch was too big and bulky and everything like that. And I took it there and I used to, I was 14 and 15 year olds, I used to show it to everybody. I showed them the sun, I had a reflective thing that went onto a plate and uh, I took them out at night and I showed them Venus, I showed them Jupiter. And, and that was just, it just kept going and going and going and going. And then I went to University of Arizona with the intent to become an astronomer and got talked out of it. By by one of my professors, so that's my story. Well, thanks, Ken. I was, I'd like to ask you. Uh, my 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 original telescope had one of those really really scary green glass solar filters. Did you have one of those? I had one of those green glass. And as a matter of fact, one of the things about that that uh, that telescope was they had a filter on the on the uh, on the eyepiece. It screwed into the eyepiece, and you put it in, and 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 apparently it was very thick because I'm I well I've been wearing glasses. That's what I had, but that's what it was. It wasn't one on the front. We didn't have one in the front. It took until I got the eight inch that I got a solar filter that was really a solar filter for it, and uh, that was that 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 was, uh, and of course then of course my the the fifth thing if you want to call it, I started chasing eclipses when I was very young. And uh, that was that was very cool as well. So, yes. Diane, uh, you just came back online. Why don't we have you go next? Diane Hall, our president, is um, one of the most go-getting people I've ever met. No and kidding. She knows. I, I lived through the Apollo era. She knows more about the Apollo era than I could ever hope to, and it's embarrassing. But go ahead, Diane. Sorry, are we doing an introduction? That well, that was the introduction. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, gang. I am punch drunk from an eleven-hour shift in Lansing today. So, uh, this is what got me into astronomy. Well, it was a book, believe it or not, and I learned to read at a very early age. I taught myself by the time I was three. I had shall we say, minimal parental supervision. So since we had a pretty child-friendly house, there wasn't anything super adult lying around, I got to read anything I could pick up. And there was a book called 365 Starry Nights by a guy named Chet Ramo, and it was a very 1970s affair. Uh, black and white line drawings and doodles, and it was a trip through the whole year in terms of what one sees in the sky, accompanied by some uh, speculative flights of fancy about what the sun, what it would be like to stand on the surface of a planet in a triple star system and that kind of thing. Kind of the thing that the Warren Astronomical Society does quite well. And there was a book called Our Universe that was a National Geographic big picture book thing with um, everything that we'd learned up through Voyager 1 about the universe and the solar system. I got a copy of that on my shelf. Yeah, so uh, that book scared me because it talked about the death of the sun and my grandmother had to take me to the doctor, the pediatrician, say, she's got, you know, anxiety and and crying and, and you know, what's it about? And... the 
pediatrician asked, well, what, what is the problem? Probably expecting your boogeyman and instead, you know, so, well, she, she's upset about nuclear war and she's upset about the death of the universe. He didn't ever have a real good answer for that. I was four. <laughs> but Starry Nights uh, totally inspired me to look up, see things. I, it's gave me a lifelong appreciation for the poetry of the stars, of star clusters, because in addition to being a, a gifted line artist, uh, Chet Ramo really had a way with words. And so thinking about, you know, a, a universe where Ober's paradox is not a paradox and everything is a wash in light, thinking about those triple star and sextuple star suns going through the sky on a distant planet, um, his description of the open cluster in Perseus around Mirfak as being sapphires on black velvet, all that stuck in my mind. And so I got into astronomy through words, even pretty more than pictures. Pretty much the same thing that happened to me. I mean, I'm, on my bookshelf, I still have a whole bunch of 1960s and 70s Patrick Moore books on my shelf here. I don't want to tell you how many I've got. Good God. That 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 seems to be a pretty much standard. I mean, I when I was a kid, I was anytime a new book came out uh like that, I was I was gobbling it up. So Adrian, let's hear from you. Hey. Got you All right. into astronomy. Yep. Man, and what got you into astrophotography? All right, so let's see if I can do this in under 10 minutes. Um, astronomy, uh, I can sum it up in one word. When I was younger, Ursa Major is the one word, Ursa Major. Um, saw the Big Dipper, recognized it um, high in the sky uh, as a seven-year-old always had interest in night sky from there moved on to a bunch of different topics but uh rediscovered astronomy late in life and i'm trying to remember when i finally did join the lowbrows um it had to have been maybe 10 or 15 years ago because i'm losing count but um it was, I remember inquiring about going to, um, going to a lowbrow meeting in an open house. A couple of events that triggered the whole Milky Way chase, uh, decided I wanted to see it naked eye. And I've, I ended up going to a, uh, a farm somewhere in a dark it, at the time it felt like a dark country area um i just drove until i noticed that there were a lot of stars in the sky and uh stood on the side of the road and just observed as and i looked for the steam coming from the pot of sagittarius um and i and i finally did see it i noticed it was there first time seeing the milky way i was in awe when i turn around to look at the dipper i noticed uh what i would learn later is called light pollution um that drowned out that part of the sky from ann arbor ypsilanti that area still couldn't really <clears throat> tell where the constellation cygnus was it was i began to learn more about constellations um and really took it really took off i had an eight inch telescope uh and observed things like uh, ngc 7331 um i think i got that number right it's looking for smaller faint and fuzzy objects to try to impress people uh impressing the lowbrow said hey i could get you know i can get those small faint objects it's no problem and then bought an imager this is where the astrophotography began to take off 
I bought an imager that was advertised as the last eyepiece you'll ever need. And in figuring out how to make it work. <laughs> yeah, how's um, that worked out for you? Yeah, right. Well, it taught the basics of stacking, the basics of uh, you know how to get an image on a screen, um, the basics of being yelled at for too much light around observers, uh, basics of how long it takes to set up and how important focus is or your images are no good. Um, so it, it was a start and in one pivotal moment, I think I was sitting around for an hour and I looked down at the screen and realized that in an hour's time, I was starting to get a shape of M11, of M101 that I didn't expect. It, it, it actually looked like the M101 Galaxy. So that was from there, I decided, well, let's move on to bigger and better things. Let's take this DSLR that someone gifted me at work, see what kind of pictures I can take. So with that, before getting formal photography training, I take this old Canon 30D and start taking night pictures and trying to hook it up to telescopes and trying to image using that and slowly but surely the images start to get a little bit better and then doug bach um i look at his setup and he goes yeah if you want you know even better images this is where you're likely headed and so i slipped back into observing for a while but then i took a photography course and i decided i'll see how much i can capture with this wide field and if we remember that milky way obsession the seed that was planted from just looking at it that began to come back i decided i'd try for it in a country uh a uh, another country setting uh 49 second barely got the milky way in the image and was pretty much hooked from there from that point, I learned about a place called Lake Hudson Dark Sky Preserve, and I went out there and I could see the Milky Way there, and I tried to image it. And you know, the first few images, you just sort of saw some steam in the sky. It looks kind of like a thin, faint cloud. So kept trying to get better. Um, ended up getting a Canon 60 someone sold it because they wanted a better model so i said i'll take this camera and i found out that a lot of astrophotographers use the camera um notice how much better the images started to look and just kept at it i think i read a few tutorials or you know looked at yeah looked at some things on youtube and started trying a couple things at the time i didn't have a tracker and took an image where i was able to get the milky way and a meteor photobomb the image and i won money from it and so it was uh that's a lot of that kind of turned into let's do some ast let's do this wide field astrophotography thing at the time a lot of the great astrophotographers pointed directly at the sky there's no landscape um i think this goes to fast forward to a few you know a couple years ago and i'm noticing a lot of photography if if they're night photographers they're more interested in the foreground and the picture looking pretty and the precision of the night sky meant nothing um the more i learned of the night sky and the more i you know listen to visual observers learn more about what's out there would stand would often stand there just looking at the sky before i image anything see how much i could see with um the naked eye if i had how, binoculars see how, how much i could see you? with binoculars how old were you when you got your first telescope uh 30 something 40 something yeah i i started very late it i said it may have been if we go 15 years from now that's 35 that may yet still be too 
that may not be early enough. I I'll say forty. Okay, so so I am going to uh, go. I'm gonna switch over to John Blum now because John Blum has an interesting story about a late starter. John Blum is the a former president of the Warren Astronomical Society. I think you were president in 2011 when I joined. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure, but he's he's been a uh, a staple at every meeting I was ever at, and uh, he he loves telling the story about how he got into it. So go ahead, John. Well, as uh, Bob indicated, I've told this story a couple times at club meetings. So those of you who've been in the club for the 20 years that I've been in the club may have heard it four times already. Uh, but uh, when I retired 20 years ago, uh, my kids, uh, my adult children, bought me a telescope because. Uh, they knew that I had a cardboard telescope from when I was a child that I got at maybe age eight or 10. And um, it was extremely difficult to use. And uh, in, in retrospect, I'll say this was a four inch uh, Newtonian reflector, but it was made out of cardboard. And the uh, focuser was uh, the eyepiece moved in and the eyepiece was, has, was plastic and the tube it was in was plastic. And there was no focus knob. You just pulled it in and out. And when you pulled a little bit, nothing happened. And when you pulled a lot, it jumped a whole bunch. So um, with a lot of effort, I had been able to see the craters on the moon a couple of times with this cardboard telescope. And so um, uh, my uh, adult kids who knew nothing about telescopes as I did uh, found in a store at the mall, a Meet ETX 90, and it had two great features. One is there was beautiful color pictures on the outside of the box, implying that that might be what you'd see if you happen to own the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, the other feature is said that you didn't have to know anything, which they knew I didn't know much how to find things in the sky, because you would it was computerized, and this was a new thing uh, 20 years ago, and you would just uh, type in what you wanted to see, and it would point right to it. So that sounded good to me. Um, and I struggled with it for several months and was never able to find anything with it or get it to point to anything uh, because the instructions did not adequately explain to me how you had to align it before it would point to anything. Uh, they don't mention on the outside of the box that uh, you have to align it on three known stars, and I didn't know the names of three stars. So um, in my readings trying to learn to use this and reading astronomy magazines and books, I I uh, found out there was something called an astronomy club, which I never imagined such a strange thing as that would exist. And uh, so I decided that one time only I would go to one of the outdoor events of an astronomy club and they could teach me everything there was to know and then I wouldn't have to ever go again. So uh, I did come to a uh, viewing event, an astronomy club viewing event. Actually, the Ford Club was the first one I went to because that's the happened to be the closest viewing event to my house at the time. And um, Somebody showed me the very basics, and it was very simple to use this telescope once somebody taught me how to align it on uh, <laughs> some stars and showed me the names of some stars. But when um, a month rolled by and I tried to do it again myself, those stars had moved. I had no idea they wouldn't be in the same place as they were last month, and some <laughs> of them weren't even the same stars as last month, which I thought was just totally unfair. So um, then I heard there was also the Warren Club that was even bigger and better, so I came out to one of their events, figuring I also would go just one time and um, learned a few more things and learned about how the sky is different month to month. And so I continued to go out to uh, both of those. And I liked both uh, Ford and Warren observing events. And I went to both of them every month. 50% uh, of the time they're clouded out anyway. So I probably averaged one event a month. And um, every time I went, I learned better how to see things with my telescope. And every time I went, they People there would tell me, well, you know, we also have these indoor events with talks and you can learn about this stuff. And I said, not interested, just want to look at the sky. Well, after a few months of looking at things in the sky and realizing I didn't know what these things were all about, they did convince me to start coming to some of our Cranbrook meetings for the Warren Club. And I found it absolutely fascinating and uh, realized that everybody there knew a whole lot of things that I would like to know and didn't know anything about. And uh, Actually, for a couple of years, I thought every person in the club knew everything. Uh, and <laughs> after I started getting to know people's names and realizing who was who, I found out there were five people in the club that knew everything. And the rest of the people in the club were partially lost to all the way lost somewhere so along that line. Um, so I um, joined a couple more clubs to get a couple more lectures because I wasn't learning everything already. And uh, I was impatient to learn it all. And uh, so I joined the Oakland Club and the um, uh, other clubs, and I uh, joined a club, uh, two clubs on Maui where I went in the winters. 
and um, gradually learn to like the indoor meetings uh, even better than the outdoor observing experiences. And um, as I've told many times before, eventually I got to the point where the best thing about the clubs was the people in it. And what I was really coming for was to chat with all you wonderful people and uh, learning about astronomy and uh, looking at the night sky were wonderful, but secondary uh, pleasures to getting to hang around with other people who were as crazy as me to be interested in this interesting topic. So uh, now I have belonged, not, I don't belong to every club I've ever belonged to, but uh, now I uh, have belonged over those 20 years to 10 clubs. The 10th one is the one I started here at Fox Run, the retirement community that I lived at in the last two years. And um, much to my surprise, uh, I think that might be the biggest club uh, in Michigan at this moment with attendance because we're doing in-person meetings and we're getting 100 people at each uh, meeting, each monthly meeting at the uh, Fox Run. Uh, wow, Jeff. Uh, but this is an extremely basic club. We do uh, absolutely beginner astronomy because the people here are uh, retirees from interesting careers and don't know anything about astronomy. So whatever I say, they think is very clever, even though I'm a beginner <laughs> in all my other clubs, I'm an advanced here at Fox Run. That's my life story. We happen to know people who can give lectures. <laughs> yes. I, hey, John, I'm, frankly, I, I'm not sure I know people who can give lectures that can be understood by a crowd of people who don't know anything about astronomy. The lectures that are given at the Warren Club are not appropriate to the beginners that I'm that are coming to my meeting. You know, John, we're all we're all going to be thinking: Who are those five people you talked about a moment ago that knew everything? <laughs> well, I won't offend the rest of you by naming them. <laughs> we're all going to be wondering that. <laughs> but I know who's. Uh, the most entertaining speaker at the Warren Club, and that is Jim with his uh, song at the end of each of his talks, which I absolutely love. Thanks, John. Okay, next I'm going to ask Doug Bach. Doug Bach is one of our astrophotographers. He's been a member of the club well, a lot longer than I have, like forever, forever. <laughs> forever. And uh, take it away, Doug. All right, good evening. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a few minutes. <laughs> actually, well, actually, he's got a presentation. Look at oh. that. That's called that's called preparation. <laughs> Jealous. Don't don't worry. It's only three slides. And, th and the second slide is just a, a, a visual for the discussion I'm gonna I'm gonna have here. Okay, so let's see here. Got to find my notes. <laughs> All right. So what first got me interested in astronomy? Well, I'll start with um, early '60s. My brother made a pinhole camera for a solar eclipse, partial solar eclipse that was gonna happen either 61 or 62. I think I was like five or six or something like that. And I had a big old box with a piece of aluminum uh, cut out with a couple of pinholes in it so that you could be looking at it, the the uh, eclipse on the, the bottom of the box safely. So you can see little partial eclipses. And then you could also see all the partial eclipses happening through the, the leaves, all the little holes between the leaves and the trees. So that was very cool. So that was my first experience with something off planet, if you will. But in 1965, um, there's a science teacher from Fraser, the Fraser High School, who uh, lived around the corner from me out in the country, which, um, by the way, was um, out near Stargate. Um, he had a three-inch F10 uh, Newtonian uh, from Edmund Scientific, and uh, one clear night he took got it out and he says, "Now let's take a look at some things." So he showed me M13 and Saturn. Well, two golden two golden objects to look at for some somebody who was, you know, nine years old. It was excellent, and I was hooked at that point. A few years later, I received a uh, Tasco 60-millimeter refractor as a gift from a friend of the family, and uh, uh, I used some uh, charts from National Ge Geographic. Every, every January, it would come out with some charts that had where the plants were going to be for the year and also some of the uh, obviously the constellations on the simple charts and a few of the deep sky objects so i could find jupiter and saturn and a few of those messy objects with my um, little tasco 60 millimeter refractor 
And of course, the Apollo program was going full bore at that point. And in, uh, in, in 1968 is when I got this refractor. So I was uh, 12 at the time. And, and of course, when uh, the uh, Apollo 11 and, and the 69 landed on the uh, on the moon, that was really cool. And I was I was 13 at that time. So a few years passed, of course, I'm in, getting into high school, et cetera. And in my phys physics class, my senior year, um, I actually um, had joi already joined the Warren Club in 1973 after I called Cranbrook in February of that year. And uh, they referred me to Jean Baldwin, who was the secretary of the Warren Club at the time. And then she uh, asked me where I lived, and I told her um, I live uh, out in Davis, Michigan, which is at 27 and Romeo Plank. And she says, oh, well, there's a gentleman who lives over in Carriage Hills, I think it was called, over there near Washington, which is where my uh, elementary school was at. And uh, his name was Lou Fakes, so that's a name that uh, some, some of you old-timers know all about. And uh, so I called him up, and he called. He said that, oh, yeah, the club meets on the third Thursday of the month down at the uh, Macomb Community College. So even back in 1973, we were meeting back that, down there at Macomb Community College. And so I made the, I think it was the February meeting. And then the following uh, month in March, I think it was either March or April, I actually joined the club. So that was my, when my uh, tenure with the, the club started. Uh, by the way, I found out that Stargate was only four miles from where I lived at the time, which was in Davis there at 27 in Royal Plank. So that was very advantageous for me to be able to ride my bike over there and, uh, you know, use the 12 and a half that, that was in there at the time. And we had star parties out there and observing sessions. So that was that was excellent uh, and really got me going uh, uh, when I joined the club. And part of that uh, learning a lot of things that, that first two years was all the mentors I had, like Lou Fakes and Pete Quantas and Larry Kalinowski, and Ken Wilson, Frank Cullen, and Dave Harrington, just to name a few. And that was the year I started to build my first telescope, an eight inch F9.4. And uh, that that year, fall of 73, I, I started to make a uh, machine, my first mount, which I still have, which housed my big uh, 12 and a half inch in uh, later years. So now I was full bore with the club, doing lots of stuff, uh, early 70s. And in 74, I entered MSU as an astrophysics major, but changed to computer science upon the advice of my astrophysics counselor. This sounds familiar with someone else that just had talked about this. And the reason they told me that was we had a conversation about what were the job opportunities uh, in astrophysics? And he said, well, you're going to have to get a PhD, so you might as well plan on eight years at least of college. And for every job that opens up, there'll be 50 applicants. So I says, hmm, hmm, I'm pretty good at computer science. I think I'll change my major. So, so I ended up getting into computer science, which was excellent because it was uh, basically as a systems analyst for the rest of my career uh, after college. So that was how I got started. Now, I just wanted to show you one thing here. Some of the telescopes over the years and some of the things you have to look forward to spending money on is I started my astrophotography in 1978 with an Olympus OM-1 uh, camera and my second eight inch telescope, which was at F7. And it's this one up here with the, um, uh, the uh, inter interviewing crew there is that eight inch F7 with a Unitron uh, on top of it. And, uh, that was my astrophotography system for uh, six years until uh, I moved out to uh, where I live now in 1984, which is when I built my first observatory, which I put the 12 and a half inch F6 in there. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna go on through any of these unless you guys are interested in a little more history of what has gone on over the last uh, 40 years. But that's basically how I got started. I just wanted to show you all the stuff that I've gotten over the over the years and it's all listed here um, in my career coming up on uh, almost well it's 49 years with the club now my first telescope looks very much like what is in the upper left there that guy yep, yep. <laughs> so that's my that that's that's my beginnings if you want I have a few more things I can talk about but we if we can go on to other people that's fine yeah yeah my, my comment is that g11 uh, something that I left out of my really long wandering recollection is 
the G11 I have from uh, John Cosland um, that hasn't gotten in much use lately because of those cameras. You mentioned spending money, and I said, I, I don't want to spend all that much money. If I add up what I've spent in camera gear, I'm pretty sure I've spent that much money. So it, it, it got me one way or another. But it's still a rewarding hobby. Go ahead. Go ahead. That task go right up there is my first telescope, too. Absolutely. Yeah, but it was a friend of the family that gave that to me uh, back in 1968. Um, I, 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 I don't even have all my scopes listed on here either. <laughs> really? Yikes. If you're worried yeah. about money on your scopes, I would advise you not to make a spreadsheet listing each item and how much you spent on it. <laughs> Oh, I but I had, but but Dale, I had to do that, and the reason I had to do that is I have a a rider on my insurance to cover it all. Uh, oh. I might need Great. to do that. Important safety. I'll sell you, I'll sell you the insurance. <laughs> all right, well, next I'm going to uh, go with Dr. Dale Parton, our previous vice president, and. Uh, he he often shows up at Stargate with a uh, with a telescope, uh, a pretty nice one. So take it away, Doctor Dale. Well, I got my start in a sense at age thirteen. Um, I saw in a book, must have been some kind of science book, a simple diagram that showed that. If you could measure the angle between the North Star and the horizon, that would be equal to your latitude. And <clears throat> I thought, I've got to see if that's true. So I put together an apparatus. I came from a very poor family in Toledo. Uh, my apparatus was a picnic table that I leveled. One of my mother's clothes props, this long wooden pole. I picked one that was pretty straight. And that night I went out and lined it, leaned it against the picnic table, <clears throat> sighted along it to get it pointed right at the North Star. Had a piece of cardboard laying on the table up against the stick, drew a line with a pencil. <laughs> the next day I measured with a protractor at the angle and I got a number of degrees. And then the problem was, how do I know if it's right? This is way before the internet and cell phones and computers. So I went to the nearest public library, looked through various maps of Ohio until I found one that had a longitude line every one degree going across Ohio. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually figured out how to interpolate between the lines to get the latitude of Toledo to the nearest tenth of a degree. Compared that to the number I had measured, and to my amazement, they agreed within 0.5 degrees. <laughs> I'm sure that was luck that it came that oh, close. How old were you when you did this? 13 or 14. So I wish I could tell you I got into astronomy in a big way then, but we had no money for telescopes or even binoculars. Then I went on to a university and spent many years there and was too busy and too poor. Then I got married and kids happened. Too busy and too poor. Too busy. And what, what finally did it for me was I happened to, I don't go to garage sales. Somehow I was at a garage sale. I must have taken somebody else to one or something. And there was this telescope for sale at a garage sale. I think it was a 60 millimeter refractor. I bought it. It was misery. 
It had a German, a plastic German equatorial mount that broke immediately when I tried to use it. I don't recall ever seeing anything with that telescope, but it was a good thing for me because I decided I'm interested in this stuff. And I went and bought a secondhand 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, which is what everybody tells you not to do. <laughs> um, and I wasn't involved with any astronomy club, so I had to figure out how to work it, how to polar line the thing, and get the digital settings, the, the mechanical setting circles to work. And the first thing I remember finding, and it took a while to find it, was M5. And I was hooked. It was so incredible to me to see that, that I, I didn't want to stop looking at it for a whole hour. So I was afraid I'd never be able to find it again. Um, and, you know, somehow I, I made inquiries and found out about the Warren Club, and I've been involved ever since. So that's my story. Thank you, Dale. <clears throat> okay, do we have any board members here? No, we don't. Do we? Riyadh. Yes, we do. Riyadh, are you there? You'd be interested in telling us how you got into astronomy? Hi. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, kind of similar story a little bit to other people. Um, I started out when I was uh, somewhere around uh, 13 or 14 years old. Actually, I was in um, junior high school and we had one assignment um, in uh, the uh, science class. It was more of a physics class um, to put together uh, a very simple microscope and try it out. So I worked on that, followed the instructions, put together a microscope. A uh, very simple thing, of course, uh, wood and cardboard and so on. A couple of uh, lenses uh, from old uh, binoculars we've had, and uh, that worked. So I was pretty interested uh, in that, and I thought, well, if I can put together a microscope, then I think I can also maybe work on a uh, telescope because that I've always been interested in looking at the moon and looking at uh, you know stars maybe and things like that. So. Um, I, I uh, actually, I, there was no way for me to buy a telescope uh, where I was at the time. Uh, so I decided to go to a place where they basically sell um, sell glasses, uh, reading glasses, glasses. And, you know, optics for that. So I purchased um, a lens. I asked for one with uh, um, with a thousand millimeter focal length, and I was asked what what I was going to do with that, and I <laughs> told them. What I was doing, so I, I purchased the lens and uh, cobbled together uh, some uh, cardboard tubing and uh, a, a, a very simple eyepiece, and I built my uh, first telescope. It was uh, somewhere around uh, maybe 60 millimeter or so in diameter. It was a singlet, of course, <laughs> but it was good enough to uh, for me to look at the moon and actually got some uh, decent images from that. And from that point on, I was kind of pretty interested uh, in, in astronomy. I had an uncle also who was telling me a little bit about um, how to find maybe some of the planets uh, where Saturn was and tried to look at Saturn, but didn't have enough magnification to really see uh, the rings or anything like that. <clears throat> so, um, and as I was growing up, uh, about another year or so, I uh, joined uh, an astronomical society in the area. Uh, where we had uh, some uh, physics uh, students uh, that were teaching uh, astronomy classes. So I, I learned a little bit more uh, there and eventually um, found, uh, I, was, I was looking for a while uh, to find a, uh, a uh, astronomical society after we moved. And uh, basically uh, it took me, I would say about uh, two or three years before I found the Warren Astronomical Society. Um, this was back around uh, 1984. Of course, there was no internet or anything like that. So it was really difficult uh, to find uh, a place like that. Um, I found them through, actually, I found first um, a store that was selling telescopes because I was trying to see if I can, if I can buy something here. 
and uh, I met, um, that's where I met uh, Steve uh, Franks uh, at Science and Things. Uh, he was the manager there at the store. And uh, he was already a member of the Royal Astronomical Society. And actually at the time he was uh, also the uh, observatory chairperson. So uh, he told me about uh, the group and uh, I started attending meetings and um, uh, I've been with the club uh, ever since. So that's it. Okay, thank you. My my wife, who is unfortunately not feeling all that good and in, us in, in, in bed, she she got into astronomy when she was a Girl Scout and she blames her mother, who was her Girl Scout leader, taking her out to Camp Metamora um, and having all the Girl Scouts sit out on on a hill and look up at a beautiful dark sky. They didn't have telescopes, but uh, they did have binoculars and uh, and their eyeballs and so that's how my wife got into it so so mark kedzier would you care to chime in mark kedzier if, if he's there has been amazingly have to? <laughs> you you don't you don't have to but i'll do i'll, I'll just let the members no, know mark I'm... kedzier has been amazingly active with uh libraries and this telescope loaner program and uh, he of, often does uh, observing uh, nights at, at, at libraries. So take it away, Mark. Okay. Um, I got my, I think, an interest uh, visiting my, I was visiting my cousin. In the neighborhood in Roseville, teacher that lived across the street. It was a clear night. And he started telling stories of the constellations. And I was just mesmerized so every time i went over to her house i was knocking on his door hey the skies are clear can you tell me a story so he would come out and do that that was pretty neat um as for viewing with a telescope uh a fellow friend of mine uh that just lived lived on the back street his name is fred popovich he was he was a he was a member of the the war he met at lincoln high school and uh his dad built a six inch F10 uh, reflector, aluminum tube, and he had two mirrors with it. So he had to keep on getting them recoded. But anyway, I, I, that was my first look through a telescope. We were doing Saturn and Jupiter and the work. So after, and I had a paper route. So I said, I'm getting myself a telescope. So I saved up my money and I got a Sears 60 millimeter refractor, which I still own to. And I, uh, the Warren Astronomical Society, and uh, it was 1967. Uh, Gerald Allier uh, called me one night, and he says I had a uh, one of our members was starting to grind an eight-inch mirror, and he got about an hour into it, and he says this isn't for me. <laughs> so he says, would you want to? Do you want do you want to grind a, a telescope mirror and everything? He said sure. It only cost me five dollars. Uh, Mr. Allier set me up with all the, you know, to process. So when I got this mirror, it's the, the old Pyrex mirrors, you know, with the little beveled angles on it and everything. And what I noticed on it, there was this, the initial grind marks where he was trying to get the center. So you'd you see the grind marks with like a, look like a Cheerio. But anyway, about 30 hours later, I finally got it uh, completely uh, uh, ground and polished. And, uh, and I was on my way from there, so, uh, but that was through up to about 1970. Then after that, it was from astronomy. Uh, I had the pleasure at that time of uh, our our club president was uh, Dick Polis, and he lived over by 12 Mile in Hoover, and he would uh, uh, invite Fred and uh, myself over to his house because Fred was interested in uh, taking you know astro photos and everything so dick i believe he had a 10 inch reflector on a clock drive mount and he would uh show fred how to uh mount everything on there so uh so that was my uh, innings in astronomy uh funny story i like to tell is my uncle uh would come over to my home and i, t I it was my godfather he's uh I just love the man dearly and anyway i just told him hey uncle ray i got a i got a telescope and uh he says yeah so anyway the moon was out and i i was showing him the moon 
and uh, he was a trucker and he owned he owned a landfill. And when he's looking at the moon, he says, man, I should all this real estate I can get so I can, you know, start another landfill. So that was that's what he liked about the moon. But uh, 30 some <laughs> years later, I told him I'm still in astronomy. And he says, uh, are you still doing that? So he, I, I guess I left an impression on him because uh, he enjoyed looking through the telescope. So anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All righty. Thanks, um, Jim. Yeah, Bob, I have a quickie that kind of complements what you said about your wife. Have at it. I guess 1949 or 50, I was a 13, 13 year old Boy Scout. Some of you have heard this story. <clears throat> and uh, our Scoutmaster took us to a observatory just about three or four miles from my home. And we went into this observatory and went into a conference room and the astronomer, the U University of Michigan astronomer there was showing motion pictures of the sun and holding them up to uh, holy he else holding a silver dollar up to the screen he said and at the size of this uh, uh this picture the, of the sun this 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 silver dollar would be the size of the earth it was a mcmath holbert observatory when it was still operating and uh i uh that, that inspired me to get interested in science and astronomy and and actually to go to the University of Michigan some years later and uh, and uh, kind of forget a little bit about astronomy, but uh, I was always interested in it. And uh, when I uh, finally retired, had some time and a few bucks, I joined the club, but that was like 2001, I believe. But it was uh, a, a few years later when Marty Kuntz uh, pointed out that he was messing around out at the McMath Hobart Observatory, which I had forgotten about completely, and I was amazed to find out that it still existed. But that's kind of what got me into astronomy. That's cool. Thank you. So, uh, Dale Teamy, let's hear from you. What got you into astronomy? <laughs> It certainly wasn't archiving all of the WASP stuff. <laughs> oh, we're not hearing you, Dale. I think you're, I'm not, I'm one not of your double you. mutes is muting. Still not hearing you. Hey, Dale. Yeah, we can't hear you. Let's see, I can't unmute you. I have to step away. My wife's computer just crashed and she wants me to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> computer science degree, Doug. I'll teach you. So glad I'm not doing that anymore. Is that the case? Dale? Now can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Now we can hear you. All okay. right. Okay. So anyways, um, I seem a little out. Anyways, uh, my story is uh, fairly similar to Diane's, where I started off with a book. My grandparents uh, gifted me uh, two books at, at Christmas time one year when I was in uh, junior high. One is for geology, one is for astronomy. The astronomy book got read. <laughs> I couldn't figure out rocks to save my life. So I spent a lot of time reading and rereading that book, spent a lot of time daydreaming about building an observatory on top of our garage so I could walk out to it from my bedroom on the second floor and go to, into the observatory. <laughs> And uh, that's as far as it got. Uh, fast forward to uh, when I was in high school, Gary Flatt from the club invited me to watch the lunar eclipse from his backyard. So after church one night, we went over and uh, watched it. My girlfriend got bored, so I took her home. 
and I went back home to my house and my sister was there. I says, uh, you want to see the eclipse? She says, yeah. So I took her over and we spent the rest of the evening watching the eclipse, you know, through his telescope. And uh, that was my astronomical adventure ending right there. <laughs> Later on at, at work, I worked for the post office. And when I became a clerk, I would see uh, mail for the Warren Astronomical Society because they had a PO box there. And occasionally we'd see a member come in and collect their mail. And uh, so it was always in the back of my mind that this society existed. And one day after work, I was relaxing and my son Brian comes home with all these boxes and dumps them in the breezeway. I said, what did you got there? He says, uh, a telescope. I go, what? It, it, at various points in my life when I thought astronomy would be neat, it never ever occurred to me to maybe look into getting a telescope. But now here's one sitting on my doorstep. So we put the thing together and uh, the story he told me was that uh, he had gone to uh, uh, that red, what was the, the astronomy store that everybody used to go to, the red something? Rider's Hobby Shop? Oh, Rider's Hobby Shop. Yeah, they had a red dot in their logo. I, said, I get the red from that. Anyways, uh, Rider's Hobby Shop. Uh, he said there's this old guy there that uh, talked him out of buying a telescope when he first walked in. And he says, you should go home and think about it. Okay. So he walked out the door. He goes, sat in the car for a while, thought about it, went back in and bought the telescope. <laughs> so we, he had a, a, a six inch Celestron uh, SET on a, a, a German equatorial mount, all uh, computer powered and everything, the whole you know, nine yards there. And uh, we set it up and he had dreams of getting into astrophotography. And uh, so for the next year, the two of us collected a maniacal collection of telescopes. <laughs> and in the meanwhile, joined the Astronomical Society because he had gone to a meeting. Um, he says, this guy that looks like uh, Albert Einstein came up to me and started talking about uh, how stars uh, populate the sky and are born and die. And it, I, it all went over my head. Please. And okay, Dave Bailey, that's who it was, yeah. And, uh, but, but I went to a meeting with them, and Brian and I went to a meeting, and I says, uh, we should join. So we did, and uh, see, I believe that would be 2007 or nine, nine, I think, maybe. And I've uh, been a member ever since. But since then, uh, the telescopes have been sold off, and for the most part, I'm down to one scope now. And uh, I always felt that I could not match the chops of those five members that know everything. <laughs> but I could help the club by helping to run it, do administrative stuff. So I've been a board member for uh, quite a few years now. And uh, it hasn't stopped yet, and I'm still still doing it. And that's my story, which I will stick to as well. I wasn't expecting this to have people, you know, uh, lead into how they join the WASP, but I, you know, I should have expected that because that's what's that's what happened. So David Levy has been chomping at the bit to tell his story. I know he's got something interesting to tell. David, take it away. Well, thank you. I hope you can all hear me. <clears throat> anyway, yes, we can. Great. Yes. Anyway, my start was pretty easy. It was in 1956, 56, July the 4th, 1956. I was at Twin Lake Camp in Vermont. And uh, they were having um, the July 4th celebration with fireworks. 
And uh, I had no idea what July 4th was all about being from Canada. I didn't know from July the 4th. And, uh, but it, being a member of the youngest cabin in camp, they sent us home back to the cabin pretty early. And as we're walking up the hill towards our cabin, I chanced to look up at the darkening sky and I saw a shooting star. It was not a very bright one. It was pretty faint and it, it kind of came out of the sky somewhere in Draco heading towards Vega, which was just rising in the east at the time. And uh, so I looked, I was pretty startled by it. And I asked the others, did you, uh, did you all see that? Did you see that shooting star just now? And they said, no, we didn't. And then I thought, a thought came into my head and it was, did you, was that shooting star sent just for me somehow? And so I put the idea of the shooting star into my eight-year-old David brain and I let it fester there for a while until a few years later, it sprouted and germinated and uh, started a passion that has not ended to this day. <clears throat> anyway, um, by 1963, I was an asthmatic living at the Denver Jewish National Home for Asthmatic Children. And I came back to watch the July 63 total eclipse of the sun. I remember a Friday afternoon, the day before the eclipse, dad was taking a nap and he woke up and he was in a dreadful mood. And he was for some reason very angry with me. And I heard him tell my mom, he said, all David thinks about are his damn stars. <clears throat> Fortunately, dad would live to regret those words. Uh, and I don't know, I really don't know why, because he was right. That's all I did think about was the damn stars. And years later, uh, we were both, I, I was more of an adult then. And uh, he said, remember when I had that dream, that, that sleep when I woke up and I talked about your damn stars? And I said, oh, do I ever remember that? And he said, may I formally take those words back? Because what I didn't realize at the time was what you were going to do with those damned stars. <laughs> and the passion that you were going to develop. And I said, well, you were perfectly right, Dad, because I was all I was interested in. And it was, I was really very one-sided and totally focused on nothing else. And uh, the idea that a telescope to me is a magical thing. <clears throat> you can look through, uh, through a telescope, but to me, a telescope isn't just to look through. It is a space and time machine. It takes you back. If you're looking at the moon, it's taking you a third of a second back in time. If you're looking at the Andromeda galaxy, it's taking you two million years back in time. And if you're looking at uh, the farthest thing that I've ever seen, which is um, <clears throat> the uh, quasar, one of the uh, quasar in Ursa Major, or actually, yeah, uh, in Ursa Major, it's like seven billion years back into time to tell us what was looking. Anyway, <clears throat> that's kind of the story of how I got interested in the night sky. And uh, I have a whole list of things that I can quote from, but the one that I've chosen tonight is a poem by Sarah Williams called The Old Astronomer to His People. And uh, he is telling us he's about to die and he's telling his student to reach me down my Tico Brahi. I would know him when we meet, when I share my later science, sitting humbly at his feet. He may know the law of all things, yet be ignorant of how we are working to completion, working on from then to now. Pray remember that I lead you all my theory complete lacking only certain data for your adding as is neat. And remember, men will scorn it as original and true. And the obloquy of newness may fall bitterly on you. But my pupil, as my pupil, you have learned the worth of scorn. You have laughed at me, with me a pity. We have joyed to be forlorn. What for us are all distractions, 
of men's fellowship and smiles, what for us the goddess pleasure with her meritricious smiles. And here is his last words. You may tell that German college that their honor comes too late, but they must not waste repentance on the grisly savant's fate. Though my soul may set in darkness, it will rise in perfect light. I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. Thank you and back to you, Brian. Thank you, David. Uh, Dave <clears throat> Hollenbach, can we get something from you? Uh, Dave, Dave has posted some absolutely freaking gorgeous pictures on Facebook, which I have liked, and I'd be interested to hear from you. Wow, okay. Um, I'm not prepared for this, but uh, I uh, I did have a spot, sorry. What? On the spot, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was multitasking. I was actually uploading some stuff to YouTube here. Let me let me pause that because that's uh. Don't worry. I actually <laughs> said I wanted to be on it's... the panel, and I wasn't prepared either. So you're good. Well, my my video is is getting choppy. That's why. Let me pause. Let me just cancel that. Okay. So um. I actually made a presentation this past year about my uh, relatively new journey into astronomy and astrophotography, and uh, that was quite lengthy, so I'll try to condense that down. Uh, I sort of came from this from a different angle, uh, closer to what Adrian started with. I'm more of a photographer, and I was looking for sort of a new challenge. Um, I'd always been interested in space and and um, uh, things of I, I like science fiction. I liked uh, uh, planets and the solar system and and so forth. But I, I really I had very little experience with astronomy. My older brother got just like many of you a Sears uh, refractor, probably fifty or sixty uh, millimeter. I'm not sure. I, he doesn't have it anymore, and and I don't know exactly. It's about twelve years old, and I had my first views of uh, space, basically looking at the moon and Jupiter, and was immediately amazed, just like most of you have recalled. Um, but that sort of sat dormant for years. I never got a telescope of my own at the time, and uh, I I was always interested in in those sort of things, but never really got back into it. So, a few years ago. Um, Ironically, I was scrolling through Facebook and someone had posted that uh, Saturn was at opposition and that with a good telephoto lens, you can actually get a picture and see the rings. And I was like, well, we got some pretty good lenses here we use to capture bird photos because we like to go birding. So I went out in my backyard and handheld, I, I, I used my strongest telephoto lens and I pointed it at Saturn and clicked away. And magically enough, I got a picture of Saturn and Triton. So I was like, well, I should try this again, but you know, go get my tripod. It was like 2 a.m. or something, my wife was sleeping. So the next night out, I did it with the tripod and got better photos. And I was like, well, where can this take me? You know, what, what can I do with this? And um, it can take you to an empty bank account. Well, if I put my telescope in my car, I can double its value. Or nowadays, maybe triple, I don't know. But um, I had seen astrophotos, posted pictures, magazines, and so forth. And I had always assumed that to get photos of these galaxies, the Andromeda galaxy, or the, you know, What's what's behind there? Behind Ken? What's his? Uh, uh, it's M one. Crab Nebula. M one. Crab Nebula. I can't think of that. I haven't imaged that one yet. Uh, I thought you had to have something massive at an observatory. You know, you had to be looking through Hubble or the Palomar, whatever. And lo and behold, I'm entirely wrong on that. 
with a simple equipment like a camera, a, a lens, and a tripod, or better yet, a mount that moves with the sky as the Earth rotates, um, you can really get some pretty amazing photos with some effort, work, technique, trial and error, mostly error, lots of trial. And I started to do this. And then if I wanted to try a different technique to do mm -hmm. something else, I would research that. And what do I need to do to get this? So um, I began to do that. It took me about two, it's been about two and a half years since I've been doing that. I've been getting some pretty decent stuff. Now, I haven't done much of anything in the last couple of months. For one, it's winter. Um, taking a little bit of a break here. Uh, but um, I started with planetary uh, mostly because it still excites me and I still have challenges with that. Um, so, you know, I went out and bought my first telescope. Oh, well, let me back up my wasp story. So before that, it's like, well, I need to learn more about this. So, you know, it wasn't the 80s. It was, you know, the, the 2010s. And <laughs> I could just simply Google, hey, how do I learn about this stuff? What's a local club? And the Warren Astronomical Society was the closest one to me. It's like, well, I should just go to a meeting. So that's what I did. And um, I went to the Stargate and star parties and and uh, started to learn. It's like, well, I need to keep coming back. And I don't know, maybe three or four visits. Uh, I ended up buying myself a used telescope. I got a Maxitov um, and brought it to Stargate and took some pictures of Jupiter and Saturn that first, uh, first summer. And um, I've been looking on the forums and, and, and resources and so forth, cloudy nights forums. And I, you know, I wanted to get a Schmidt Cats grant. I was thinking an eight or maybe a nine and a quarter. Well, I ended up getting a really good deal on 11, but I needed a mount. So one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And and uh, that's that's where the, uh, <laughs> the addiction comes in. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, well entrenched in this hobby now. It's a good hobby to have over a pandemic. Um, and uh, for a while there, every clear night I was getting out and imaging, even though I don't have an observatory, it's just set up in my backyard. Um, but I've gotten to the point where the, the images I'm getting are pretty good quality. I'm really trying to plan out some more elaborate things. Um, but uh, I've, uh, I've been really enjoying it. I've been trying to participate and the meetings here and uh, fascinated by all the stories you have and have sort of a, a lifetime of questions built up because I'm late to the game, but uh, maybe not as late as some others, but, you know. Well, you've only been doing this a couple of years. I, I, I could have sworn you've been doing it for more. Well, you know, I've been doing photography for more. I think I read somewhere that someone had, a professional photographer, had said that he thought astrophotography was the epitome, uh, the highest form of photography and the most difficult and most challenging. And I, I would certainly would agree it's the most challenging. So I've, so I've had a professional photographer say that he didn't want to do astrophotography because of all of the additional work that goes into it and the fact that as a landscape photographer, He's used to figuring most of it out with settings and filters and capturing it right there in camera. There and are, there uh, is no one way to take a photo. Very true. Uh, and no one way to take an astro photo either. That's, that's true. Know. I mean, you you can spend a lot of time doing a lot of different techniques, or you can just pull out a smartphone. Do it sort of organically right from the camera. You know. I choose to post process more on the on the the back end, but you know it's it's an art form, really. It's an expression of art, in in my opinion. Two words so. for astronomy: bigger, and actually three words: bigger and more expensive. When you <laughs> start with astronomy, it's bigger and more expensive. And those well, are the you know, two. My biggest telescope isn't my most expensive. 
No, but I know what you mean. But you yeah. always look to try and get bigger or more expensive. Aperture fever. Or, right. Yeah, or or uh, cameras with uh, you know more advanced sensors. More stuff. Um, you more, know, stuff. more stuff comes out. I got four <laughs> packages this week from the Cloudy Nights forum, so it was a busy week for me. I got so you're the reason it's up. been super cloudy these past few days. It was me project. because I went and got an Explore Scientific portable mount. And so, yeah, it just never ends. It's harder to find the clear skies these days, thanks to folks like us. I thought it was just because I got that other scope, too. So, thanks, guys. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we won't hold you. We'll hold you harmless this one. But in the month of February, anything new you get is on you, Steve. Thanks. thanks. I might do an article on what I'm working on because I'm kludging together various parts from various sources to turn a 20-year-old telescope into an astrophotography rig. So we'll see. All righty. Thank you. Um, Diane, is it time? It is yes, sir. 9.30. 9.30, bottom of the hour. Thank you very much for the full scale participation. Thank you, um, everyone. And I learned a few things about y'all in spite of knowing some of y'all for 15 years or more. So good deal. By the way, that, that picture, so, picture, behind me, picture behind me right now, that's a picture of the 1991 uh, solar eclipse in, in the Baja. From right to my left, to my, to your, your uh, left. That's, that's, that's cool. what we shot of photography. <laughs> yeah, I chose. It's, it's a good one. Yeah, not bad. Eclipses are behind pretty, me. You know, I, that's part of my journey as well. You know. Yeah, hey, Diana. Twenty-four, Dale. Yes. And yes. Is there a way you can send me the the text the chat session? I can't. It won't give me the option to save that on my phone. And I'd love to explore all those links that were provided. Let me see. I know I can save it when I'm on my computer, but I'm on my right. cell phone. Let me check into that, Victor. Um, okay. In the meantime, keep on chatting, y'all. The room will be open as long as the moderators want it to be. Thank you very much, Bob, for moderating the uh, panel. And we'll see y'all, if not at the open house, then at Virtual Cranbrook in February. And I will work on trying to save this chat for you, Victor. Yeah, usually the the, the host of the event, at least through Zoom, uh, automatically um, uh, saves the the chat session. That but would I be don't know about, but but I don't I'm know not, about this. Yeah, I that would be tail. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about this application though that we're using. Um, so simply copying and pasting would you might have to do. I don't know. If you guys can hear me, but I wanted to add just one thing to the recent comment about bigger and more expensive. Much as I enjoy using my telescope, I think what I enjoy the most about the night sky is when there's no telescope and it's just me and my eyes looking up at the night sky. And that I doesn't agree. taste anything. Or a, or a nice set of binoculars. Or this is from Greece, by the way, gang. Is that a transit of Venus or just a, yeah, a mighty Venus. round that was a sunspot? Night, night. That was in 2004. Very nice. Yeah, well, those I are my yeah. Well, yeah, lately, you have some... go ahead. Late, lately, the pictures I've been dealing with, uh, we have a lot of clouds in Michigan. And um, the picture you behind me was taken two days ago um, with an iPhone. I've actually started experimenting with nightscapes. If the stars are not out, what can I do with the clouds? Um, I've always pushed forward. You know, if it's too cloudy, you can't enjoy the astronomy hobby. And I've tried to push through that and say, well, maybe I can do something um, so that I'm not just sitting idle and waiting on Dale and uh, you know, Steve to stop buying equipment. I can... Um, you know, so the stars can come out, but um, <laughs> I find it, you know, the nightscape behind me is, you know, it's Lake Huron. It's at the, it's at the point 
normally there'd be stars filling the back of that image, but it's the uh, Port Austin Nebula instead. So there's there's always I'm adding challenges to what I take a picture of and what I use. Just using a smartphone, I find it produces an interesting look to an image, um, whereas the mirrorless or DSLR, I have chances for more, you know, sharper images um, when I do that. So it's the the hobby goes on and on, and um, I'm sure fortunate does. enough to sell some of my work, which it's like if some if someone else wants to buy your work and put it on the wall, it always feels good. But but it is for the sake of the night sky itself that I always go out. Well, we're glad you do, because you do a great job, kid. Unbelievable amount of work. I... How many miles you put on your truck a year? <laughs> um, You're all well, over the place. I, all over the place in Michigan, and I'll probably start driving into Ohio eventually. Um, I'm pretty sure the mileage uh, would be enough to get me to uh, the Pacific Ocean and back. To the moon? Well, maybe not quite there, but... <laughs> That's, yeah, 200,000 miles. Well, let's see, the truck right now, since I bought it in 2017, it's at 140,000 okay. miles and growing. It, I think that's 140,000. I'll look at it. It might be 170,000 miles at this point. And it's already undergone some surgery. So it's, uh, it's had some engine, it's got new engine parts in it. So uh, it's still going. New I tires new, will be next year. Got a new guide camera and um, a, n another planetary camera. Uh, some ones that I've been sort of on my wish list for a while, and some came up on a good deal on Cloudy Nice. Like, I'll take them. So, always get new stuff, even if I I might not yep. use one until the summer. So, <laughs> but. Uh, I just put a note in the chat. Anybody use the uh, that Celestron next image, either the five or ten megapixel imager? I think it might be similar. I had to that. I had one of those when I bought my initial telescope. It came in a gargantuan package of stuff, and down in the box, <laughs> um, he said it was a next in image, but it actually turned out to be the ten megapixel version. I thought it was the one megapixel version. Yeah, I got the ten. Well, anyway. I made a adapter for the back because it's got a USB connector that goes into the back of the thing and you're slewing the camera and it's pulling on the cable and the cable would pull out or it actually got loose in there. So I've got a 3D printer. So I designed a little cap with a little tube that comes out to hold the cable. So just want to throw that out. If anybody had one or needed a cap printed, say let me know. So just solve that issue. Yep. I've printed some stuff out it's 3d printer is very useful in astronomy seems to be i've been having fun with stuff right, that, that sounds like a presentation that needs to be done how have you modded your telescope with a 3d printer <laughs> yeah printed a bunch of stuff printed some feet i have some tpu that have the some cushion to it and so printed some feet for the tripod and see a holder for the camera or for my my cell phone Right there. That's an adapter yeah. to, to hold a. Uh... All right. Something they're just Something talking. There. You're done on that. Go ahead. It's to hold an autofocus or oh, an lens. Find a grid. Find out what the so, Made some about. kits for a couple of different ones. I had to put the lens back on. This is the setup I use for uh, holding my um, 135 millimeter Sammy Ang lens, but it's still in the container. I have... Adrian just used that one. Yeah, I and haven't. I haven't used it still, since. So. Hopefully, it's still put together because I I used it a couple times and then I tried to make sure I didn't break it. Those, those are some nice lenses, and the one that I got from you, I I, I love has, it so. Yeah, it's been responsible for like the last few images. Try to 
Yeah, I bought some step down rings so I Lately. can change the aperture without diffraction spike. So that's another thing I'm going to test. Yeah. Let's see if I can. I'm going to try and find an image that one of that your lens was responsible for. Um, somewhere out here, those are old. Let's see. Nope, nope, those are this image. It's cropped. Uh, but I believe this image is uh, your 14 got the original original which is just a wider field of this i cropped it down to the business part of uh this uh this field of view haze was coming over the uh sky so a lot of the starlight was coming through sky and um so but i noticed how well the bright stars of cassiopeia show up next to the lighthouse and there's the double cluster um, to its upper left. So it's, uh, but yeah, your your lens has already been responsible for uh, helping me acquire some images here. That's gorgeous. It's a great lens. It's a, it's a telescope in its own right. Yeah. So I only used it for about a month doing astrophotography and then was on to something else but i need to get back in and, 